about uh, accounting basics. Oh, thank you, Tara, for hitting the, the, <laughs> the record button. I have a big yellow sign too, and I was about to press it. Thank you very much. Uh, so welcome everyone. I have a, a quick little um, video that I wanna share with you first. I'm Jamie and I'm uh, uh, hosting this webinar today on behalf of PAC. And uh, so for those that don't know who PAC is and those that might view this a little later, I wanted to uh, kind of introduce PAC and let you know who we are and why, why we are here. So let's get started. So welcome everyone. I always have issues with this being able to go to the next slide. There we go. So who are we? Um, PAC is a third party certification um, council. So there's a few differences that a lot of people, even my husband actually, we had this conversation a week ago about the difference between a certificate and certification. And there's different certification processes as well, but the main difference between a certificate and a third party certification is that one is an educational process and wasn't, one is an assessment process. One is for newcomers and, and kind of experienced professionals. And then the third party certification, it actually requires some sort of professional experience. There are requirements in order to sit for a third party exam. Um, things like your um, one's an education provider. The other one is again, assessing and we're, we're being tested by a standard setting organization. Um, demonstrates knowledge of course content. So you take a course, a program, you get a certificate to, to put up on your wall, as you'll see behind me, where a third party certification is, it is that you do get a certificate, but it is something that uh, usually expires. It's something that you would have to do continuing education um, courses for why we're here today. And at some point during our presentation today, I will have a CEU for those that are PAC certified um, for coming on and, and listening to this uh, presentation today. So it requires that every three years that you renew your uh, certification and you have to have some sort of ongoing education in order to support that. Uh, it is something that can be revoked as well. So there's always um, requirements to, to maintain and demonstrate what we're doing and our code of ethics and, and making sure we're doing things uh, up to PAC standards. Um, we are not the educator. We are simply the um, the test. We, we create the tests and you take it. And we have outsiders like Ashley here today who is going to educate and help you get those CEUs that you need to recertify. Uh, Every industry has some sort of third party certification. We're the only one for the pet services industry. So that's pretty, pretty cool. And it's super important in, in our industry of having that. So why is PAC important to you as a pet parent? If we have any pet parents on the call today or those that might listen a little bit later, uh, we have no standards. We have no regulations in the pet care industry. You can wake up tomorrow and say, hey, I wanna open up a, a 50 dog facility and have no experience whatsoever. Um, so having this third party certification, it allows you to know who to look for, who to hire, where to go. Um, you're not left to navigate you know, these things on your own, that we're here to help you. Uh, PAC certification allows a pet parent as well to identify the most qualified, the most knowledgeable. So wouldn't it be amazing if we had this big pool of uh, certified professionals and then you get to choose between all of those good ones of who you would like to hire. Um, that's incredible. And uh, so why is it important to your business? We want to maintain uh, our edge uh, in a competitive market is because anybody can come into it. Uh, we want to make sure that pet parents are getting the right information and hiring the right people for safety and, and the well-being of our, our animals. We have the professions requiring uh, independent certification. It gives you confidence in your employees. Uh, documented uh, commitment to excellence, safety, and continued education, which we've talked about already. And then recruiting, you know, incredible employees and building trust and, and having transparency, super important. Um, so we always ask, do you know what you're doing if you're a pet professional uh, and you're caring for people's pets already and you're taking money for it? Uh, are you good at what you do? And if that's yes to, to those, 
we want you to take the exam. And our next exam uh, deadline is May 10th. Uh, the next exam cycle is June 10th to 24th. Um, if you're interested, please join our study group. Um, we'd love to we'd love to chat with you and, and get you prepared and help you out. Um, and uh, if I believe that's it for my little my little spiel on on uh, who we are and what we are and why we're doing it. So I'm gonna send this back over to Ashley and uh, let's get this started so that you're not waiting too long. Thank you, Ashley, for joining us. And uh, I'm gonna get you to introduce yourself so that um, you can kind of share what you'd like. So thank you for joining us today. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Um, I am Ashley Moore. I do know some of you and recognize some faces and names uh, here on the call, but for those of you that don't know me, I am a pet care loan officer at First Financial Bank. So I specialize in the pet care industry. And what that really means is that I understand more of what you guys need, right? To run your businesses, what makes you guys successful, what your financing needs are. Um, and when I look at your financial statements, I can understand them a little bit better. Um, so with that, um, that's kind of where we're going with this presentation today. Um, we're going to talk about some common accounting pitfalls to avoid as a small business. So a lot of times, you know, you'll see different accounting reports, um, different add backs, different things like that, that, um, you know, some can cause some issues for you down the road. So what to avoid as a small business, what can set off some red flags to us as, as your financial um, backers. Uh, components and overall purpose of an income and expense statement when managing a pet care business. So why are those financial documents important? What does that mean to you? Um, why should you know the financial health of your business, right? We're going to talk about accounting documents, terminology, procedures, and their rules. So there are different types of documents. We're going to talk about what all of those are, the differences, and again, what why is that important to you? What does that mean for you and your business? Um, and you know, what does that mean in terms of expansion or exit strategy and, and those types of things? We're going to go over some financing examples and cash flows because at the end of the day, when you come to talk to the bank about looking for an expansion or when you're evaluating whether or not you're ready to expand or evaluating whether you want to purchase a facility or whatever the case is, at the end of the day, cash flow is the, you know, the name of the game. So we're going to go over some of that. And then we're going to discuss the importance and the components of a business plan, because th this is definitely one of the most important pieces that you can have when it comes to longevity and health of your business from a financial standpoint. And a lot of times it gets missed or misunderstood. So we're going to go over some of that. Um, but before I jump in to all of this, I wanted to ask, oh, whoops. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I wanted to ask um, how many of you are on this call are owners? You can put it in the chat chat or raise your hand or, or do raise a little your, emoticon. Let's have some fun with the emojis. Yeah, send me an emoji if you're a current owner. <laughs> awesome. Very yeah, cool. We're getting lots of thumbs up. Yes. Awesome. Now, one more question. If I asked you to pull out your P&L tomorrow and send it to me, I want a different emoji if you would be able to do that. Awesome. I'm seeing that makes me happy seeing the emojis come in for that one. <laughs> Love it. Very cool. Great. And, and, and really that, that is an important piece of it, right? Is knowing where your financial health is right now and being able to access those documents. So what we're going to, you know, go over today is going to help you prepare for that. If you don't know what they are right now, we're going to teach you. So my, there we go. All right. So 
Your financial statements, what the bank will be asking you for is really composed of three documents. So one, you have your balance sheet, your income statement or your P&L are pretty much interchangeable. And then the third is the statement of cash flows. So we're gonna go over what all of these entail, what they mean for you as your for your business and the different components of each. And also, if any of you have questions, I don't think I, I mentioned this. If any of you do have questions as we go along, please feel free to raise your hand, put it in the chat. Um, I am happy to stop and answer whatever you need. I wanna give you guys the most out of this that you possibly can get. So yeah, feel free to stop me or I'll try to leave some time at the end for questions as well. Um, should you have any that are kind of kind of off these topics, but all right. First, we are going to talk about the balance sheet. Now, the balance sheet, as it says here, is really a snapshot of a company's financial condition. So where does your business stand today in terms of equity? And all that equity is, is your assets versus your liabilities. Now, your assets are anything that your company possesses, right? Inventory, real estate, even your client list has a value, right? That is an asset. Absolutely. So that would go on that left side, that asset side of that balance sheet. On the right side, we have liabilities and liabilities are any debts that the business possesses. So any loans, credit cards, anything of that nature that was used to finance the business or purchase those assets. And at the end of the day, those assets minus those liabilities equal your equity in your business. So that bottom line, how much you know value is there left over from you know the, those liabilities that you might have. So the assets that you have as your business are divided into two different groups. First and foremost, we have the fixed assets. So these are anything long-term that will help to bring in income. And this is anything at all from real estate, if you own your own building, own your own land, anything like that, any equipment that you have. And this is interesting because people don't normally think of, you know, a kennel run as equipment, but it's absolutely equipment. So this would be part of that fixed asset portion of that balance sheet. And one that I, I, I see missed on balance sheets a lot that I think shortchanges people is those intangible assets. So essentially that intangible portion of your business, if you were to sell your business tomorrow and ju just the business, no property, no equipment, nothing like that. If you were just to sell your business tomorrow, what would your asking price be? What would that value of your business be? There, there is a value there. So you should put that on your balance sheet as an intangible fixed asset because it absolutely is, you know, a value add to that business. The other type of asset are current assets. So these are things that will be used over the course of the year. So think things like cash, right? You use your cash in your account to, for things like payroll, purchases, ongoing expenses, utilities, whatever the case is, that cash is planned to be used over the next, the course of a year. And hopefully, you know, it builds back up, of course, but you're looking for turnover there. Um, inventory, stock, those types of things that you're expecting to have to re-up on, those would be those current assets, but they absolutely go on, on that side of the balance sheet and do add value to your business. Current liabilities, similarly, um, well, liability, liabilities are also divided into two groups. Current liabilities, similarly, are things that would be paid within the next year. So ongoing rent, you know, typically you pay that on a monthly basis. Um, credit card bills, um, any type of service that you use on a monthly basis. You know, if you have a software system that you use and those types of things, like liabilities would go on that side of the ledger. Your long-term liabilities, these are things like a bank loan, right? Whether it be for your business or for real estate or something like that, or, you know, a long-term equipment loan, anything that you would expect to pay off in longer than a year. 
um, that would be your long-term liabilities. So overall, again, once, when you look at the balance sheet, those assets minus those liabilities, so essentially the left versus the right side of that balance sheet equals your owner's equity. And that owner's equity is what balances the balance sheet. So if you have $500,000 in assets, $400,000 in liabilities, that equity is going to be $100,000. So why is this important? What can you use this for? Any potential investor or any potential lender is going to look at this and you know to help decide whether or not the company is a good investment or something that you know has the potential to be lent to just because you want to make sure that there's appropriate use of those liabilities to obtain those assets you want to make sure that that company is is operating in a healthy manner. Um, it also helps with your organizational strategy. So your strategy moving forward. Um, you want to make sure you know, you're working in such a way, excuse me, <coughs> sorry about that, um, that is helping you to build equity in your business and not taking away. Of course, you know, there's a common phrase, you have to spend money to make money, right? in order to obtain those assets, a lot of times you are going to take on liabilities, but the goal is over time to help build up that equity in that business. Any questions so far on balance sheets? Yes, so we just had one come in uh, from Amy. Uh, liabilities would also be daycare packages that haven't been completely used, right? Uh, for example, a 10 day, a 10-day daycare pass with seven days remaining on it, the dollar value of the seven days is a liability? Yeah, correct. So what you would do in that case, um, you can even, I mean, accounts receivable, right? If you're expecting to have that money come in, you can put that on the left side of the ledger, but accounts payable would balance that out. So and, and absolutely, looking at the chat here, good reason to have expiration dates on a package. Correct. Yeah, that way, you know that money is coming in. So you can put that in there as accounts receivable as an asset. But just, you know, it, it'll balance out with, with the payable portion of it. So you can, yeah, if you're expecting that revenue to come in, you can definitely put it on the balance sheet. Anything? That looks like, yeah, that looks like uh, it so far. Awesome. All right, so we're gonna move on to the next one, the income statement, more commonly known as the P&L. All right, so there are two different ways to look at an income statement. So you have the accrual method, which is looking at those anticipated revenues and expenses. So just like we talked about, it'll have that accounts payable on their expected revenues to come in, right? So if you're expecting, you know, if you have <coughs> 10 dogs booked for the month on a, you know, a package and you're expecting that revenue, put that on the um, income statement for that. The cash method is an immediate recognition of revenue and expenses. So really it's a, a real-time snapshot of that money coming in versus that money going out. So this is over a given period of time. So a lot of times you'll see income statements run on a monthly, a quarterly, or an annual basis. Um, you know, people will also do side-by-sides where they'll have, you know, January versus February or 2022 versus 2023. So they'll be able to look at that side-by-side -side and say, okay, what is, am I doing this year versus last year? What am I doing last month versus this month, last quarter? So it's a period of time it gives you a good idea of what's coming in and going out um, at that point. And at the end of the day, at the end of that income statement, the net income is really what you're looking for. So that's your cash flow for your business. And that in, net income is revenue. So everything that's coming in versus minus expenses, so everything that's going out. <coughs> so again, this will show the company's financial performance over a period of time. What's great about these two is it can show you your trajectory and your growth year over year 
and also how well you're doing compared to your expected performance. So if you put projections in a business plan, how well are you stacking up to those projections? Are you on target to meet those projections or do we have to do some adjustments? And again, this, this is used as understanding to adjust the plan for your business moving forward. So if you're on target and your plan's going well, stay the course. But if you're looking at your income statement and you're not making as much net income as you had hoped or were planning on, and you're a little bit behind, what do we need to adjust to catch up to that? So when looking at an income statement, there are some different pieces of it. Um, one is the income. So any goods and services. This can be, you know, obviously any income from daycare, boarding, grooming, anything like that. All of those revenues coming in. Any inventory sales. So if you have a retail store, retail footprint, anything that goes along with that, it's going to outline the cost of goods. Now, some people do this part differently. Um, some will put any costs of any of their inventories, any uh, supplies that they need for their ongoing operations. They'll put that in cost of goods. Others put them simply in the expenses so their cost of goods appear lower. One way is not better than the other. It's going to be accounted for one, you know, regardless of where you put them, but cost of goods is a piece of that. Gross profit margin. So your gross profit margin is just your income minus that cost of goods. So what's before the remainder of your expenses? What is your company bringing in? And then we have all of your expenses. So this will include everything from payroll, what you pay yourself as the owner, utilities, rents, advertising. This is a list of everything that goes into running your day-to-day -day operations. Once you account for all of those, you'll actually get your operating income. Now, what's interesting though, the operating income you get before your net profits. Now, your net profits are what you get when you start doing addbacks, right? So, and what I mean by addbacks are things that actually can be added back into your profits, things that, you know, cost, have a cost to them throughout the year, but don't actually take money out of your bank account. Things like depreciation on your building. So, you know, if you have a, if you own your building, there is a cost that, that you put into it on an annual basis of value that is taken from that building from just wear and tear and things like that. That's depreciation. It's not actually money coming out of your bank account, but you account for it on your income statement, but that gets added back into that net profit at the end of the day. <clears throat> so here's an example for you. Um, and this one actually is a side-by-side -side and then gives you a total. So a little bit interesting. You can see, see the changes in the months, but this is January versus February of 2021. And you can see some of the different operating expenses that are on here. Some of the different uh, incomes that they have listed on here. But at the end of the day, you have your net income down at the bottom. And you can see that there's, um, oh, Lord. sorry, I think we got, got that part cut off. I was going to say, you can see some add backs, but I don't think you can in here. Um, you can kind of see what those side-by-sides look like and be able to make a comparison. So what is great about this, again, is that it can show you, okay, if I was expecting to have a better February than January, it's not really, you know, it, it doesn't appear like I brought in more money, but at the end of the day, I actually net more in income than I did in January. So what changed from January to February to help bring in more money for the business. What did I adjust to make that work? Was it those prepay packages? Was it you know, a change in my staffing? What, what did I address to you know, change that percentage of net income? So this kind of helps give you an idea of ways to address any issues or continue good things that come up in your business. Any questions? I've got nothing in the chat room at the moment. Awesome. All right. 
So now we're going to talk about the statement of cash flows. So this one is probably the least understood of the three statements and the least used, I would say, um, by people. And what the statement of cash flows is, is it measures true inflows and outflows. And what I would relate this most closely to is a bank statement, right? So you're seeing all the money coming in and all the money going out in real time. And it'll give you that balance on an ongoing basis. So it's, it's very similar to what a bank statement would look like. And when you look at, say, an income statement or a balance sheet, a lot of times, I, I call it fancy accounting <laughs> sometimes, because accountants know how to, you know, save on taxes, or, you know, you might have going into, you know, on that income statement, you might have, I've seen ones that have five cars in a boat running through their business, right? Most of us don't need a boat to, to run our, our ongoing day-to-day -day operations, but from a tax standpoint and accounting standpoint, it can make some sense to put, you know, a lot of those expenses on there. So this statement of cash flows will really give you a better idea to, to see how, you know, what's actually coming into your business and what's actually going out on an ongoing basis. It will use information from the income statement in the balance sheet to create this actual statement here as well. But overall, it's just a little bit harder to manipulate this one. And it it's, gives you a, a good snapshot of things, you know, from you know, a, a certain period of time. One thing that's interesting with this is that, you know, on the income statement, you might not actually have that cash on hand. Remember, we talked about um, accounts receivable, those types of things, expected income. This shows your actual liquidity at any point. So if you brought in 100,000 and 90,000 went out, it's going to show 10,000 at the end. It doesn't really account for any of those. Uh, things that haven't happened yet or are expected to happen. So it'll show changes in any of those assets, liabilities, equity, um, but it'll help you to project out what cash flows you can expect in the future based off of what you see on this um, statement here. So with these three statements, why are they important? What do they do for you as a business owner? So your numbers really tell the story of your business, right? How healthy from a financial standpoint it is. Are you making good, sound financial choices? Um, and you can use these numbers to know if you're ready for growth and expansion. And, and I find it interesting because, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people who are, are ready, you know, or feel ready for <clears throat> their next step, you know, in, in their ownership, um, process and they'll want to expand, but don't really have an idea of, okay, what is that going to cost me in terms of, you know, additional expenses, how much, you know, in comparison to what do I currently am working with is going to go into this new business. If I'm, you know, having trouble at my current facility with staffing, or I, you know, infrastructure or whatever the case is, am I ready to put that into a new facility? And the answer to all of those, you know, you might not be having issues. You might absolutely be ready. It might be the perfect time. Um, but you definitely want to have all of these ducks in a row to know, you know, am I ready for that? Is my current business cash flowing and can I cash flow uh, what I'm, you know, planning on doing? Is it going to generate a return on my investment? Because, you know, getting a loan for any type of expansion or, you know, planning anything like this is a large investment. You want to make sure you're getting that return on what you're putting into it. When you're ready to sell a business, this is so important because, you know, you've put blood, sweat, and I'm sure tears <laughs> into building, you know, what, you know, your business and, and what you've done so far. And you want to make sure that you're getting the full value out of it. And, and it can, you know, poor accounting and poor management of these documents and these numbers 
can really be a detriment to you getting that top of the line dollar for your business. So you might you know, be leaving literal hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table because when you have a well-run business, when you look at the actual value they'll to, of what the, that bottom dollar is worth, you'll get a multiplier of your net income. And remember that net income is your revenues minus all of your expenses, cost of goods, all of those things, that bottom dollar of what you're bringing in on an annual basis, you'll get a multiplier of what that business is worth. And if you're a well-run, awesome business, you'll get even a higher multiplier. So even, you know, say, you know, the net income is $100,000. If you're getting a five times multiplier, your business is worth 500,000. But if you can get a seven multiplier, it's 700,000. So the better run the business, the better opportunity you have to get those higher multipliers and get more um, at the end of the day. So my recommendation, if you're looking to sell a business, would be to definitely start bringing in experts, um, start really evaluating those financial documents, you know, three plus years in advance, because us as the bank, we're looking at three years of that history and most business valuators will too. So if you're ever planning, you know, your exit strategy or growth or whatever the case is, you want to make sure that 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 three years of history is as healthy as it possibly can be to get that top dollar. These documents are also very important in buying a business. So if you don't own now and you're looking at, you know, potential purchase options or you're looking for your next facility and you're looking to purchase one that's existing, we tell people all the time, never, never, never accept poor or outdated financials. You want to know what you're purchasing and you want to have a full financial picture of that. Um, we, you know, we want you to see the potential in a business. We never want you to pay for it because you're going to pay for it in that sweat equity that, that I had mentioned earlier. So um, you definitely want to make sure that you have at least that, at least that three years of financial history to be able to look at, to know, okay, am I getting a fair price? Am I paying what I should for this business? And you also want to be able to look at these if you're initiating a new service. So same as growth and expansion, that's, that is a growth. That is an expansion of your current business. And you want to make sure that when you're bringing something in, is this, you know, going to generate additional revenue? What is the cost going to be? Is this going to, you know, increase that net income at the end of the day? So this all goes into business planning. Um, and projections and being able to put all of those together to really, you know, paint that picture for yourself. So if I'm putting in X, am I going to get Y? And you want to be able to answer that question before taking that leap and adding in, you know, additional services or square footage or, or whatever the case may be to, to your business. Do we have any questions that have come in? No okay. questions, but Stephanie made the comment. Um, she says, my goodness, it's nice to see someone <laughs> from a bank understanding and acknowledging how tough this industry can be. She's loving this presentation. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. No, and that's, I mean, it, it can be tough. And it's it's not, you know, I, I, I talk to a lot of people who have a pie in the sky vision when they come in, you know, especially startups. Um, things like that. And um, I, I definitely remind people on a regular basis, you know, I, I love dogs. I have three of them myself. I love animals. You're not playing with puppies all day. <laughs> this is a legitimate business and you have to have all of these ducks in a row and you're going to put so much effort into it on a daily basis. Is it worth it and rewarding? Absolutely. But I just, I definitely like to prepare people for that and definitely have an understanding that this isn't, you know, an easy path to follow. It's a rewarding one, but, but can be difficult. So um, speaking of the pathway, good segue there. Um, we're going to talk about business planning and why that is important. And, you know, we have those three financial statements, 
But if you're looking to expand or you're looking to take that next step or you're looking to start up, whatever the case may be, we want to see your plan. How are you going to pay for what you plan to do? So um, that is why a business plan is important. It's your blueprint for your business. It's your pathway. It's your road. And it isn't something that you write and you stick on a shelf. Just like those financial documents are ever changing and growing and developing with your business, so should this business plan. Along with that business plan, do you have a supportive team? Do you have a team of experts with you? Do you have that CPA that will be able to understand the nuances of a pet care business and get you the most out of those financial statements? Do you have an attorney that knows the rules? essentially that, I mean, there, there are specific you know, rules that you guys want to follow and do they understand what, you know, your, your pet care business entails. Having a bank and a financial planner that can help you through this process too, that really understands the ins and the, and the outs of the industry can be super beneficial because, I mean, even I'll have situations where I'll get projections for an expansion or a new business and somebody who's not familiar with the industry might look at them and say, you're crazy. You know, oh, you expect to add in doggy daycare and do 500,000 in the first year. You're nuts. Well, that's the small end in some cases. So yeah, having, having somebody who can understand those nuances is important too. Do you have a strong team and staff to support any new services or growth? And again, I, I think this is probably one of the biggest stressors and one of the biggest problems that people are running into right now is that staffing is getting good people and having good people stay. Um, so when you're looking to expand, does your market support that, you know, not only from a business standpoint, but also from a staffing standpoint? Um, another question to ask yourself, do you have the cash on hand or are you able to obtain the working capital? to be successful? Are you going to be running yourself dry? Or are you going to have cash in the bank to support this, this transaction and this growth? Um, because that's one thing, you know, you might be able to sustain it now, but if you, you know, are doubling your expenses and it doesn't pick up as fast as you thought it would, do you have enough cash there to support the, that transition as you're growing? And then also, is this the right location? Um, do you, are you in a location that can support additional locations or staffing or growth or whatever the case is, whatever your business plan future is, um, is this the right location? So um, when you look at those components of a business plan, and we'll discuss that a little bit, do you, do you have those demographics? Do you have all of that worked out to know if you're in the right spot? We have a quick question, uh, Ashley. Yes. Uh, Steve asks, are loan payments recorded on the PL? Yes. So um, what how that works um, depending is dependent on how your business is set up, actually. So a lot of times if you have um, if you own the real estate, a lot of times you'll set up a different company that actually owns just that real estate. It's like a real estate holding company and it'll rent it to your, your operating business, right? Um, in that case, you would just record rents back to that business and then the real estate holding company would report those loan payments. But yeah, if not, if you're just having those, those loan payments, then yes, you would report that as um, an expense on the PL. Perfect. Thank you. You are welcome. Anything else? Nope, so far that's good right now. Awesome. All right, so why do you need a business plan? Again, the biggest piece of this is that it's your roadmap. It's your way you're going to get from point A to point B and reach those business goals that you're looking for. So you, know, you might have the goal of expanding to a second location. You might have the goal of expanding to a third. You might want to add in, uh, you know, additional groomers, whatever the case is. Um, you have a business goal in mind or a number that you want to hit. How are you going to get there? Well, this business plan is going to tell you. 
And again, this is an ever-changing, ever-growing, ever-expanding document, just like your business is. So, you know, I think if we look back on just the past five years, three years, I'm pretty sure if I asked everybody on this call if their business plan would have changed, probably say yes. <laughs> Um, we had a little thing called COVID hit us. And I think um, that through most five-year plans, 10-year plans, future plans for a loop. Um, but I will say that the people who had a good plan in place and were able to pivot quickly were the ones that rebounded the fastest. So us as the bank looking at those financial statements we take 2020 with a grain of salt, right? We need it. We want to see it. But what we're really looking for, because that year was so different, is rebound. Did your business recover in 2021? Were you able to get back to those pre-COVID numbers or do better, right? And I mean, we saw an influx of puppies and adopted dogs and the need for daycare and all of those things, the people that were able to adapt to those new business needs were the ones that recovered the best. And the way they were able to do that so quickly was to have a good plan in place and to be able to change it. So with this business plan, one of the biggest things is it actually tests the feasibility of your idea and your business model. So it puts on paper, okay, if I add this service, this good, what can I expect to get out of it? And what is it going to cost me? Right. So you actually put those projections and things like that in there and it tells you, okay, this is a good idea and it's going to get me what I'm looking for out of it. It helps to communicate your mission and vision. So it tells people that are reading this plan, you know, what is your business all about? What do you want to do with it? Where do you want to go? And what, what does, you know, what are your core values? It'll help you to better understand your target market. So again, it helps you to define what piece of that pie you're going after, right? Because there are, especially in this day and age, lots of different types of pet parents, right? <laughs> we have the people who want blueberry facials and a treat on their puppy's pillow and a tuck-in at the end of the night. And there's other people who are like a dirt floor and a roof over their head will suffice. So those are fewer and far between, I feel like these days, but who's your target market? Who are you going for? This can all be defined in your business plan. It helps to examine the competition. So it lets you see, okay, your competitive landscape. It gives you an opportunity to look and say, okay, who else is out there in my vicinity? And again, this is going to change and grow and definitely has in the past couple of years in this industry, right? So this part of it is an ongoing thing. Examine your competitive landscape. Is somebody coming in that's trying to take that target market from you? And if so, how are you going to address that? And you should be able to answer that in this business plan with your differentiators. So determine what those are. You know, are you going to be a high-end offering? Are you going to be, you know, the low cost provider, you go, what, what differentiates you and why should people pick you over your competition down the street? It helps you to determine your financial needs. So when you come to me as your banker, I want to know, you know, what, what you're looking to do. Are you purchasing real estate? Are you purchasing a business? How much money do you need from me? You should be able to come to the, you know, your me or another banker or whoever you're going to, you know, whatever financial institution you're going to, an investor, whatever the case is, and say like, I need X amount of money because I am going to do this with it. That should all be laid out by the time you're going to ask for it. And that's not to say you can't, I mean, I, I love helping everybody determine that and helping get, you know, through that process and get to that point. But when it's time to actually ask for the money, we should have that all worked out with this business planning. It's going to outline those financial projections and those timelines. Again, this is so important. How much money is this going to bring in? How much is my business going to grow year over year? What do I expect to do in five years? And, you know, I, I talking to people who really don't have this laid out and, you know, might be looking to do a startup or whatever the case is, there's always that million dollar goal, right? I'm going to do a million dollars in X, Y, Z. But how are we going to get there? 
and you know obviously a very feasible goal for a lot of people in a lot of places but we need to be able to outline what timeline it's going to take to get there and those projections both income and expense related um, you want to identify your team and the organizational structure of your business are you going to be the manager are you going to be in there operating it on a day-to-day -day basis or are you going to hire somebody are you going to have shift supervisors are you got you know what what does that layout look like and what is everybody's responsibilities that is going to help create systems within your business help you run fast run better uh, get things done faster uh, cut down on confusion and honestly at the end of the day save you money because time is money and this will definitely help to get you you know along in, in a more cohesive manner um and, but at the end of the day you know it will help you secure that funding that loan help us to see your vision and your mission and how you're going to get there to get that roi to get that cash flow to pay back that loan because it, it you know when it when it all comes down to us as the bank when we're looking at your business model and we're looking at what you're planning to do we just need to know if it's going to make enough money to pay that loan back right and having your finances in order having a business plan showing us how you're going to do that are the steps that are going to get you there to get you to that that growth you want but again end of the day creates creates a map for your business and helps you get from point a to point b any questions? Yes, we have a few actually. Awesome. Um, the first one is, uh, do you need to have a separate business account when you open a business or is that essential at, at the beginning? So you mean like a business bank account? Yeah. Um, it depends, right? I, I would say yes. Um, I would suggest it to keep everything um, clean and clear and you know you know how much is going in and out of that business you don't want to muddy it with personal finances right so my suggestion would be to try to keep everything in clean as clean and clear as possible now when you're first starting out you know a lot of people are sole proprietors those types of things things can get a little muddy a lot of times even tax returns will be intertwined um it'll all be on one big return um I still suggest trying to keep it as separate as possible because once you are to the point where you know you're ready for funding or you're ready for those next steps, it'll be you'll be in a much better position to be able to show, okay, this is what my business brought in, this is what's going out. And that's not to say that you know you can't put money from your personal account into your business account and vice versa. Like you you can do those things, but you want to try to keep it as clean as possible. Absolutely. And then another question we have is how much in reserves do you suggest? Oh, so this is very business dependent and very um, dependent on things like your ongoing expenses, right? So if you're expense heavy, if you have high, um, you know, staffing costs or you have a lot of, you know, inventory that's getting turned over on a regular basis, you're going to need more in reserves. But if you know, you're operating it and you have two employees and it's a smaller facility, then you're not going to need as much in reserves. So, um, I mean, it, it really, I don't want to give you the, it depends um, answer, but it, it really does on your business model. I would say the more expense heavy you are and, and the more, you know, differentiated you are, to be honest, you know, if you have more services, that are going to require more staffing, the more in reserves you're going to want to have. But if it's a very simple, you know, you kind of can calculate exactly what's coming in and going out. Um, you're not going to need as much. Um, but I, from, from our standpoint, like if we're looking at, you know, say income, we look at that, um, you know, P&L and we're looking for a debt service margin. And what that means is, okay, how much, you know, of this net, like how much extra in that net income is there to pay, you know, after you pay everything, how much is left over? So we like to see, you know, 1.25 or better. So um, the higher that debt service margin, 
you know, the higher net income you get on a monthly or annual basis, the less in actual cash reserves you're going to need because you're getting that income influx um, more often. But yeah, unfortunately, it's kind of, there's no really like dollar value to it. It's kind of just facility dependent. Awesome. So far, that is all we have in the chat box. Awesome. All right. So again, one of the biggest things you can do or best things you can do um, when it comes to making sure you're getting the most out of your finances is create a good team. You're an expert at what you do. You know, you're an expert at your business and, you know, especially, you know, PAC certified, you, you can't not be an expert <laughs> in, in this field, but um, create a good team that's experts at what they do. You don't need to be a banker. You know, you obviously need to understand your financials and, and what is going into your business and what all that entails, but let your banker do their job too. One that knows the pet care business, whether that's us, I mean, there's, there's others as well. Whoever fits you the most and whoever's model fits you the most, just like you guys have the target market, find somebody who you mesh with and that knows the pet care business and can help you through that process. Trust me, it will be a lot easier for you. Consultants are great. You know, if you're just starting up, I always recommend having a consultant that can help you through that and make sure that you're setting yourself up for long-term success. Might seem like a big cost at the beginning, but it will save you and make you more money than you put in. I, I can assure you of that if you, if you find a good one. Um, and what's interesting about it is people think it's just for the startup phase a lot of times that they'll have a consultant. Absolutely not. If you're looking to grow and you're ready to expand or even by the time you're ready, you know, you're trying to plan your exit strategy, a consultant's going to help you so much in that process. Get a good accountant that knows the pet care industry, again, because they're going to help you make sure that those expenses and everything that you're putting into those statements are, are exactly where they should be. And a lawyer that knows the industry too. I, I think, honestly, across the board, the biggest thing is somebody who's there to work with you, who understands what you're going through and able to kind of help you through that process. I think those are the biggest pieces, pieces of this. And somebody asks, can you recommend uh, some bankers that are experienced in the pet industry? Bankers that are experienced in the pet yeah. industry? I mean, first financial. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say hi. Um, <laughs> no, so... We at First Financial, and I'm, you know, this is at the end of the presentation. Usually, I think I'm, I'm running up on time here, so I'll, I'll chat about it briefly now. Um, I work just in the pet care industry. Our division is just in this industry. We're at all of the conferences with you guys. We keep our finger on the pulse, right? Um, we have members of the team, they may not have owned a pet care business, but our business owners are our managing director. Some of you may know Swanda, she's a pharmacist, owned a pharmacy. Um, I've worked with numerous startups in this space prior to joining the bank. So, you know, we're very well-versed in the pet care industry and are, you know, here to help you guys and, and really want to help you walk through that process. Um, but again, I mean, there, there are banks that do have divisions dedicated to pet care um, and you can find somebody that meshes well with you and yeah but I, I definitely I mean even I say all the time even if you don't go with us or you're going with a local bank or you know we want to be a resource right so always 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 please feel free to reach out to me and I will help you through whatever process even if you go with somebody else um, I'd, I'd love to help just make sure that we can you know, make your business as successful as possible. I think it, that would be a, a geographical difference as well, what to recommend because everybody lives in different places. Mm -hmm. um, Stephanie, uh, she says she would love uh, to see some round numbers as examples. So like maybe a condensed uh, P&L or a CFS, for example. Um, do we have any of those to quickly add to the 
presentation or, oh. or is that something that we should do on our second one? I think we can definitely do that on our second one. I don't okay. think I have anything handy other than that um, one first one smaller PL. Yeah, but I can definitely um, or we can get together after this. I can get everybody some examples for sure. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, we're definitely doing another one because this was amazing. So mm -hmm. yeah, we, we got to do a follow up one, right? We absolutely we will. We absolutely will. No, yeah. I, I definitely and trust me, I can talk forever. About all this, so <laughs> um, most definitely. Um, any other questions? No, Amy just says, this is great. This has been a fantastic mm -hmm. presentation. So thank you. Awesome. Thank yeah, you guys. Everybody's saying thank you. I think all oh. the thank yous. Actually, uh, we do have a few minutes uh, remaining. Um, I don't know how much you have left on your um, no, I think, slide. No, uh, I, I will wrap up quickly. If Okay. Well, I'm going to give out just because I know people might have to drop by the end of the okay. hour. So I'm going to give out the CEU code now just so that people okay. have it. And then if we have any questions or anything like that, if you guys have your portals ready, you got a pen and paper ready, CC230021. That is CC230021. And thank you. Um, but that doesn't mean you can hop off yet. We're not quite done yet. Uh, continue, Ashley. <laughs> awesome. No, I will wrap up quickly just in case a couple more questions trickle in. Um, we really kind of already talked about this, what we need to review. We'll need, you know, your profit and loss statement, your balance sheet, three years of tax returns. Make Just make sure you have your finances in order, whether you're, you know, this is for your personal business, if you're looking to expand, or if you're purchasing a business, make sure that they're willing to give you all of these things. Um, transaction reports are great too. Inventory sales, production, average transactions, cost of goods, all of those things. Um, having all of that handy or obtaining that from a facility that you're looking to purchase is important. So just make sure you have all of these ducks in a row when you're ready to move forward. And that actually was it. So, um, again, we... Swanda, myself, our entire First Financial Bank team, we want to be a resource for you guys, first and foremost. So um, happy to answer any other questions now, but if you know you want to contact me, my contact info is right there. Um, whether you just, you know, it's not in your plans to do anything expansion-wise or anything like that in the near future, but you just have questions, please reach out. If you're in the process with somebody else have questions, let me know. Happy to help. Oh, we appreciate that so much. And I just want to say thank you. Uh, First Financial Bank is a diamond sponsor for PAC. And without you, without your sponsorship, we wouldn't be able to spread our PAC message uh, and the importance of third-party certification in the pet industry for our pet parents and for our pet professionals. So we just want to say thank you so much uh, for that sponsorship. And as well, just taking the time today, everybody is in here with uh, uh, great accolades saying thank you so much. Great presentation. Uh, we do have a few questions, if you don't yeah. mind. Absolutely. Um, so would FF uh, First Financial Bank uh, do a valuation as a service event if you're not ready to sell yet? So we do not do um, act like the business valuations ourselves. Um, I would recommend going to a consultant or something of that nature for um, evaluation. There are companies, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, getting over a cold. Um, there are companies that specialize in just business valuations. We, if we ever do a loan for you, will get a third party one always. So whether you're purchasing a business, selling, whatever the case is, we will always do that third party valuation outside of, you know, the bank. Um, but I would say go to a consultant um, or there are specific companies out there that do business valuations, but try to find one that's specific to the pet business because they will be able to better determine those multipliers and get you the best value. All right. She says, thank you. And then I believe this will be the last question, unless somebody has another question to kind of, to sneak in there. Who determines the formula for pricing a pet business? Great question. So at the end of the day, it's your EBITDA. So your earnings, and then you add back, um, you know, interest depreciation, those like not actual, you know, money taking expenses that we talked about. Um, it's your EBITDA, so your net income, and then there will be a multiplier associated with that. A lot of times we see multipliers that are four and a half, five times, but 
those business valuators that I talked about, those are really the experts in determining, okay, this cash flow, what should those multipliers be? Um, and like I said, in this industry, a lot of times we'll see it about four and a half, five times, um, but it can vary depending on the type. So um, really, I would say get somebody who's knowledgeable about this industry to do a business valuation um, and a certi certified in that area as well. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we don't want to take up any more uh, of, of everybody's time. Mm -hmm. We know that it's uh, time is everything, right? Yep. Uh, so we just, again, want to thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thanks for those that are going to be watching this afterwards uh, when you get off work or, you know, when when time allows you to be able to, to see this amazing presentation. And it was an amazing presentation. Uh, I look forward thank to you. the next one. We'll connect yes. and we'll get that organized. And uh, we'll have, a yeah, an accounting uh, 201 maybe is what we <laughs> need, right? Yes, um, yes. Everybody saying thank you so much. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, thank you, First Financial Bank. Have a great day, everyone, and we'll see you again. Take yes. care. Thank you for having me. Have a good night. Bye-bye.